Psalm 149 in Sweet Psalms 1 through 6 of Psalm 149. Praise ye the Lord unto Let us pray. Our gracious Father in heaven, we call upon thy name, giving thanks for the return of the Lord's day, the public worship of the church, and thy presence with us by word and sacrament and spirit as the God of all grace and the God of our salvation in Jesus Christ. We know that thou art a God who is long-suffering, who is rich in tender mercies towards all of thy people, a God who has spoken to us in great love in the Holy Scriptures, and a God who calls upon us to receive as truth everything found in thy word, to devote ourselves to thy cause, to yield ourselves, body with all its members, in the service of Jesus Christ, and not to yield our members the instruments or weapons of sin unto unrighteousness and unto death. We thank thee, Father, that thou hast called us and given us a place and a name in the great kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we know that whereas the majority of kingdoms which have ever been 
are today dust and ashes, rubble, the sorts of things read about in books or dug up by trowels, and all the kingdoms of the world, including the kingdom of the beast, the man of sin, and son of perdition, they too will be destroyed. We thank thee that we belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ, a kingdom that is everlasting and that will never pass away, and a kingdom which is established in all things and perfectly sure. Give us faith, Father, to embrace the glory of that kingdom, though it's invisible, though it's despised, though it's even mocked as non-existent by many, and though it is hated and opposed by the sin in every human heart. And we ask, Lord God, that being united to our King, Jesus Christ, being conformed to his image, and so molded into faithful citizens of that kingdom, we may be as sure of it as confident in it and far happier in it than we are even with our citizenship in whatever kingdom, realm, or nation to which we currently belong. We ask, Father, for all of us here in this place, for thy blessing which makes rich, for those in the church who are on holidays or sick and at home, for all who join us wherever they may be in these British Isles or further afield, that together we may promote and extol the worthy name of Jesus Christ, the slayer of Satan and sin, the one who is coming again, who will radiate the entire heavens with his own glory, flanked with the holy angels, and who will call all to account and divide up rewards among his faithful servants. We thank thee, Father, that these gifts that he purchased by his death on the cross have already been measured out according to thy sovereign will, and that to some degree in this world upon the church on earth, but the full riches and splendor of the kingdom will be given to us on the great day of our union with Christ perfected at the resurrection of the dead. We ask, Father, for the victory of that kingdom all around the world, in all of the nations and islands. We pray, Father, for thy saints who are persecuted, impoverished, and wretched. And we ask, Lord God, that all of us may love the truth and not love our own lives unto the death. We pray that thou would strengthen us so that we're enabled to fight the good fight of the kingdom, that we're not conformed to this world, that we're not deceived such that there is no battle or there is no difference or there is no cause, but instead, Lord God, make us zealous. Use the godly example of David who typifies Christ and his glory in the psalm we're studying to inflame us to greater ardor in our love for thee, and we pray, Lord God, that this may characterize our children too, that it not be lost in our generations, but that the next generation may be more faithful and godly and upright and not lackadaisical and captivated by a careless and different spirit. Work by that spirit of Jesus that raised up our Lord, that will raise us up bodily, and that alone can quicken us onto faithfulness in service. We ask, Father, for our sister churches in North America, for the Covenant Evangelical Reformed Church in Singapore, and we pray, Lord, for conferences that are planned in Castle Well in July, before that in the Philippines. We ask for a good rest, especially for those who are weary with after homeschooling, for a rest for the Christian school teachers after a busy year of work, comfort them, for rest for all of us even through some holidays and a break from some of our ordinary labors so that we may be refreshed, the better to serve the care, Lord God, for those who are sick 
and those who care for them, and even those who grow weary and tired through caring. We ask, Lord, that God provide strength for all of thy people and help us to live in marriage as thou hast ordained, likewise in the church and in our homes, that we honor the good institutions that thou hast given for the ends that thou hast appointed, that we not rattle around in them as the ungodly, who neither know marriage, nor family, nor state, nor workplace, where everything is confusion and rebellion. And we ask, Lord God, that thou work in us to fulfill the calling of human beings under the eye of Jesus Christ to bring honor to thy great name. Work this desire in our hearts so that each one may pray with the godly desire each day, hallowed be thy name, and may thy kingdom come so that we do thy will on earth. Forgive and cleanse us, Lord, from all of our many and deep failures because of thy mercy's sake and because of thy love for thy only begotten and incarnate Son. Amen. Let's return to the 34th, where David is harassed by the king of Gath. We'll sing 17 to the end, 17 to the end of Psalm 34. <clears throat> the righteous cry long to the Lord, he to them is here, and they are of their troubles all by him delivered are. The Lord is ever nigh to them that be of read from Job chapter 30, Job 30 verses 1 through 19, a passage which is similar to our text this evening, for Job experiences some of the similar grief to that of David. Listen now to his complaint and grief. In Job 30, 1 through 19. But now, as opposed to the days when he was widely and greatly honored, but now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. 
Yea, whereto might the strength of their hands profit me, in whom old age was perished? For want and famine they were solitary, fleeing into the wilderness in former time desolate and waste, who cut up mallows by the bushes and juniper roots for their meat. They were driven forth from among men. They cried after them as after a thief to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in the caves of the earth, and in the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed. Under the nettles they were gathered together. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth. And now am I their song, yea, I am their byword. They abhor me, they flee far from me, and spare not to spit in my face, because he hath loosed my cord and afflicted me. They have also let loose the bridle before me. Upon my right hand rise up the youth. They push away my feet, and they raise up against me the ways of their destruction. They mar my path, they set forward my calamity, they have no helper. They came upon me as a wide breaking in of waters. In the desolation they rolled themselves upon me. Terrors are turned upon me. They pursue my soul as the wind, and my welfare passeth away as a cloud. And now my soul is poured out upon me. The days of affliction have taken hold upon me. My bones are pierced in me in the night season, and my sinews take no rest. By the great force of my disease is my garment changed. It bindeth me about as the collar of my coat. He hath cast me into the mire, and I am become like dust and ashes. Amen. Psalm 109, verses 21 through 27. Psalm 109, 21 through 27 also is a similar description of David's misery in our text. And this one, Psalm 109, is another Psalm of David. 21 through 27 of the 109th. What do the four thine
worship the Lord as we give our offerings. Let's read together our text, Psalm 69, verses 10 through 13. Psalm 69, 10 through 13, as we continue our study of the most avoided messianic psalm. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, And I became a proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me. And I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me. And in the truth of thy salvation. If you've looked at your bulletin, you may notice that tonight's title is Godly and Ungodly Responses. It's a fairly unusual sort of sermon title. You could even say it sounds like a pretty unexciting sermon title. Godly and 
ungodly responses. So this is a messianic psalm. I was hoping for something more. For all that, though, this is exactly what the text deals with. And one can only pro preach what's there. In this psalm, after the Lord has been reproached, we have in our text David's first response. That's included in verses 10 through 11. And then in verses 10 through 12, we have the wicked's response to David's first response. And in verse 13, we have David's second response, that is, how he responded to how they responded to him after he had responded to the Lord's name being blasphemed. And so I say again, if you want a title that sums up what's there in the text, then godly and ungodly responses will do it. It covers all four verses and explains what is going on. And even dealing with the subject of godly and ungodly responses, a little consideration will indicate that this is actually something very significant, practically and spiritually. You could say that the Christian life consists largely, if not exclusively, with how we respond to things other people, what they say, what they do, especially how we respond to ill treatment, how we deal with those who attack the Lord, how we respond to those who reproach and mock us. And we remember too that this morning we partook of the Holy Supper of the Lord, and so by definition, therefore, a Christian ought to be someone characterized by godly responses. We eat and drink Christ in the supper, and we respond godly. That's at least the theory. That ought to be the practice, and it is to some degree. And we ought to respond rightly, too, to ill treatment. And the evil response that's spoken of in our text, and we'll deal with that, too, that ought to be very far from us. Let's look at godly and ungodly responses. We have the first response of David here. Then we have the wicked response of his enemies. And then the second response of David. Let's sum up then what we saw last week regarding the blasphemies against Jehovah to catch the drift of the argument in Psalm 69. Some of these blasphemies against Jehovah, drawing examples from the life of David as it's recorded in the Bible, would include such things as those spewed from the mouth of Goliath the giant from Gath. We looked at that in some detail from 1 Samuel 17 from different perspectives, actually morning and evening. Then we have the blasphemy against Jehovah that was Saul's and Doeg's slaughter, not only of the 85 priests of the Lord, but for good measure also of the women, children, and sucklings in the city of Nob, so that they, the human beings in that priestly town, and even their livestock were, as much as laid within the power of Saul and Doeg, wiped out. That was an assault on God's name. First Chronicles 13 verse 3 even informs us that Israel did not inquire at the ark in Saul's day. David tells us that in that verse. David viewed that as a assault and blasphemy against God that his people Israel and his king anointed in that office Saul didn't even care and when wicked Absalom 
son of David's own flesh, rebelliously attacked his father, that was an assault on the divine promise regarding David on the throne, regarding Saul, who was to succeed him on the throne, with both of those men being pictures and types of Jesus Christ. And so David says in Psalm 69, verse 7, For thy sake I have borne reproach for thy sake. Shame hath covered my face. For thy sake I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. They don't want to know me. And then he explains why. Verse 9. For the zeal of, and the meaning here is for, for the zeal that I have for thine house and worship, O Jehovah, hath eaten me up and devoured me, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee, O God, are fallen upon me, so that I burn with them. And we notice that both halves of verse 9 are quoted by Jesus Christ regarding his experience on earth during his incarnation because he burned more fiercely with zeal for God even than Old Testament David. What then was David's response to these reproaches upon God's name? Verse 10 tells us he wept. He shed tears. David didn't shrug it off. It's no big deal. Indifferent, apathetic. The Bible tells us that he, he wept. And David was an emotional man in a good, righteous, godly sense, and he wept. I wept, he says, verse 10. Another scripture says, Rivers of waters run down my eyes and upon my face, because they keep not thy law. That was David. He didn't only weep. He tells us that he fasted. Now we sang Psalm 109. In Psalm 109, verse 24, he tells us that he also fasted, presumably on another occasion, when he was betrayed by a supposed friend. That's the subject of Psalm 109. And it is a messianic psalm dealing ultimately with Judas Iscariot's betraying of our Lord Jesus Christ. And David says, Psalm 109 verse 24, My knees are weak through fasting, and my flesh faileth of fatness. Which can only mean that through fasting with grief, he lost not only strength, my knees are weak through fasting, but he even lost weight. My flesh faileth of fatness. And with a brief mention in this sermon, you may even recall another famous occasion, more famous, when David wept and fasted, namely, when he besought the Lord to spare his infant son. When he'd been told that because of his adultery, the child born through that sin would die. And David wept and fasted because there was mercy with God and he held out some hope that the Lord may yet relent and spare the little boy. And when we move to the New Testament... Pretty early in New Testament history, we read of Jesus Christ fasting from food for a whole 40 days. Right at the start of his public ministry, immediately following his baptism and installation into the public exercise of his office. <coughs> David weeps because of this blasphemy. He fasts. The text even says... Thirdly, that he wore sackcloth, a rough, coarse material that would irritate the skin. And the idea of it 
this especially in the Old Testament, is that it symbolized grief and mourning and sorrow. And this, of course, goes hand in hand with David's weeping and his fasting. He wept, he sorrowed, he fasted. So that his eyes wept and his belly fasted and his skin was clothed with sackcloth. He's saying thereby that me, all of me, I'm grieving before God because I'm offended at the offense laid upon his holy name. This isn't the only place, even in the Psalter, where David speaks of his wearing sackcloth. Here's Psalm 30, verse 11. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. And there's something at the very least there of a figurative way of speaking. But again, the idea is that sackcloth and mourning are synonymous. Psalm 35, verse 13, another psalm of David. As for me, he's referring to his enemies who slandered him. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting, and my prayer returned into mine own bosom. And there's a famous occasion too, namely when God struck Israel with a plague, that David and indeed the elders in First Chronicles chapter 21 put on sackcloth, mourning as the Lord slew people throughout Israel for David's sinful numbering of the people. And if we widen it out, there are a great number of people who put on sackcloth. Jacob, when he heard that Joseph was dead, it actually was a lie, but he didn't know that at that time, he put on sackcloth because of grief. Isaiah and Daniel in his famous prayer in chapter 9 putting on sackcloth. Godly kings such as Hezekiah of Israel and even the penitent king of Nineveh and these Assyrians and even the animals. They put sackcloth on the animals. That was really going to time. And on other occasions, though still in an ungodly way, even wicked kings of Israel like Ahab and Jehoram in a tight spot, were reduced to putting on sackcloth. And we have, too, the two witnesses in Revelation 11 putting on sackcloth as they rebuke the world for its covetousness and wickedness, a call to repentance for the world as the church symbolized by these two men. And if we think of the Gospels, you'll realize that there is no reference in Scripture to Jesus Christ being clothed with sackcloth. And that may well be because it was only an outward picture of the real thing. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Don't tear them. Don't put on sackcloth as such because we all know how that degenerated in the Middle Ages into just externalism and self self-righteousness. And when we read about weeping and fasting and putting on of sackcloth, and this especially today, we think that our own spiritual preparations for the Lord's Supper are pretty paltry. We don't think to ourselves that oh, we're sort of really godly Christians and we're very impressive warriors in the kingdom of heaven, we, we read the word of God and here's David set up for us as an example. And he says, I wept, verse 10, I chastened my soul with fasting. I made sackcloth also my garment. And we say regarding the man after God's own heart that that man was a spiritual giant. 
And then we say, Lord, we did humble ourselves. We confessed our sin. We came for mercy and we approached the Lord's Supper in a good conscience, though far from perfect. And we say, Lord, forgive us for that too because whatever we do is always, always very weak. And if we were to meditate upon the scripture that deals with Christ's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane just before the cross, never mind actually having been there and heard, it, heard his tears and weeping and lamentations, then too we, we think, Lord, forgive us, forgive us too for even our most devout worship. And that's the way we should think. We should think that we compare ourselves not with each other, which wouldn't be wise, 2 Corinthians 10 says, we're to compare ourselves with the word of God. So this is what David did in response to their mockery of the Lord. That's the first response of David. How did they respond to his first response? After all, this man, he's, he's weeping, he's, he's fasting, and he is putting on the sackcloth. You might have thought, well, even the hardest sort of heart would have felt a certain degree of sympathy for the poor man. Look at him over there. He's on his knees and we hear him weeping. See, maybe we were a bit sore on him. But they weren't touched by his affliction at all. No sympathy. You may have thought that they would have had a certain degree of awe for his integrity. We've been calling them names. We've been attacking him and his God. And whether we like it or not, we don't really go in for his religion at all. But you have to admit that the guy at least is sincere. We don't really believe it, but he seems to. And so I'll give him a nod and say that the guy seems to be genuine. He's obviously gone too far with his religion. The whole thing's over the top. But at a certain level, he might earn respect. And sometimes you hear about Buddhist monks doing things up in Nepal or whatever, and you think, I mean, this is absolutely crazy, but, you know, putting themselves through that ordeal, rather them than me, I mean, they must believe it. But, but they didn't get, but David didn't get any sympathy, and he didn't get any nods of approval, at least that the guy was genuine. Never mind any idea that some of the people were converted. Here's David, he responds in a godly way. He sets a holy example, but nobody here, at least in Psalm 69, nobody felt sorry for their sin. Nobody repented. Nobody turned to the Lord. Nothing. Instead, the text explains, and that in quite some detail, how they did respond. They continued to speak against David, and because he wept and fasted and put on sackcloth, they even spoke against him all the more. And they weren't just speaking now about him, never mind for him. They were emphatically speaking against him. And here he goes again. Look Look at that David guy. Look at him. There he is. He's crying. He's the big crybaby. There he goes. He's wearing sackcloth. And there he is now. He's fasting. Just shows what a real cretin he is. That was their approach. That's what they thought. They thought of David. They spoke against him and even reproached him. Verse 10. When I wept and chastened my soul with thanksgiving, with fasting rather, that was to my reproach. And this means that when David wept, fasted, put on sackcloth, these became grounds of reproach. Here were even more reasons to criticize the guy and slander him. These things just show, this was the argument, and you think, what sort of an argument is this? But this just shows what a terrible person he is. Absolutely awful. And the Bible speaks of our good being evil spoken of. And the more good David did, the more evil they spoke of him. Because they were perverse and twisted. 
When you read this psalm and think about it, I can only conclude that David's weeping, fasting, and putting on of sackcloth, that the idea wasn't, well, really, he's only doing that because he's insincere and he's a hypocrite, but he's just trying to show off in his piety. But they thought instead, no, David is sincere, if they would have put it that way, but he's too strict. He's too religious. And the guy is a nutcase and a fanatic. Verse 8. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Even my own family hate me. For, here's the reason, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Now David here is being despised and mocked worse than Paul was in Acts 26, but there is at least this similarity. Paul defending himself and his vision on the Damascus road to his accusers in the prison in Caesarea. Much learning, that's what Festus said to him. Paul, much learning has made you mad. You've read too many books, you've gone absolutely crazy, and please, just, just stop it. Quit, quit. You've gone nuts. And of course, there was someone treated far worse than Paul in that instance in Caesarea and David here in Psalm 69. Far worse. Because Jesus Christ, during the three years of his public ministry, and especially on the cross, was reproached and reviled, despised, and they couldn't come up with bad enough words to hurl at him. And yet it goes on here with David. David says, not only did they speak against me and reproach me, but, but they made me into a proverb. I became a byword, says verse 11. Now, a byword is a person or thing cited as a notable and outstanding example or embodiment of something. A byword. An outstanding instance that immediately conjures up in your mind something else. I'll give you an example. Sodom. Sodom is a byword for the abomination of male homosexuality, and it's a byword also, slight extension of that thought, of God's hatred and aversion and destruction. Paris is a byword for fashion, amongst other things. I'm not saying I'm into fashion or anything like that, but it just is. You know, so and so is a model, and they're off to Paris. Well, that's okay. That's related to the perfumes and the clothes and so forth. It's a byword. Whether it's a good or a negative thing, it's something that conjures up. It's a class. It's an outstanding example or embodiment of something or other. Well, David in Psalm 69 says that he became a byword. And when it says that David became a byword, it means he was a byword for a religious nutcase. Now, there are real religious nutcases. You know, people who fix the day of Christ's second coming, like Carl Campen, and people who are insincere, and people who do behave contrary to the word of God, and they're motivated by an evil spirit, and not the spirit of God. But David here is one who is God's man, behaving righteously, and he is a byword for a religious extremist and head case. And he's so bad, this David, that he ought to die. That the world is too good for this guy. And the sooner he's put to death, the better. And this strikes us as very odd because we go to church. We read the Bible. We go to catechism classes, the little ones, and we rightfully think that David was a wonderful man. And when we think of all the figures in the Bible 
David is the sort of guy who might win a popularity contest because he was so human and so wonderfully emotive and you're warm to him. And you can go right through his life with all these amazing stories. That's what we think of David. Now we know that some people, because his life and the Psalms mention that some people wrongfully hated him and slandered him. But whenever you read he became a byword for some sort of an evil religious person, you think, oh, really? Yet that is what the passage says. And with Christ, it was even worse. They called him Beelzebub. The Lord of the Flies is working in him. And maybe he is the Lord of the Flies. He's just <coughs> Satan. That's what they said of him. And then Jesus says, if they hate me, they'll hate you. And if they call you something bad, you should remember that they called me something far worse. David became a byword. And if it's possible to be worse than a byword, it's to be a song. David tells us he became their song. And when you hear David, along with the word song, you think, ah, he's the sweet psalmist of Israel. He is the man, even in the Old Testament church and in the Bible, never mind the whole of humanity, but he is the number one man that God chose by his grace to write more inspired songs than anybody else. If you push that thought a little further, David and songs, you may recall that there were occasions when he was a favored subject in a song sung by Israelite women after the wars. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. And they played the timbrels and danced when the victorious army returned. And of course, there was one person in Israel who didn't like that song. So they've attributed thousands to me and tens of thousands to him. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And so eyed him suspiciously from that time onwards. But here, David feature, features as the subject in another song. Namely, as the one mocked in the song. They ridiculed him. They made him look foolish and wicked in their songs and laughed at him. And that takes a degree of malice, plus a certain degree of imagination, plus a certain musical idea where you get a wee tune and then you get somebody you hate and you put him into the song and then he goes, oh, what a clever song, and they ridicule him. Ah, we like that one. We hate David too. Let's sing that one again. Can you put that into the chorus too? That's how unpopular he was with these people. This was the man after God's own heart, his own appointed king. And here he is, the man who wrote most of the inspired Psalms, and he becomes the inspiration of songs that mock him. <coughs> Not everybody in Israel liked David. And Jesus Christ, too, was and is mocked in songs, wicked songs by his enemies who blaspheme him. And Christ has also been derided in the songs of some in Christendom. The Arians in the early church, this was the first attack on the inspired psalm book that we read of in any detail in the history of Christendom. The Arians wrote their own songs to sing in their own churches, the Arians being those who followed Arius, who denied the deity of Jesus Christ, and they wrote songs to teach the people in their congregations that Jesus was not the eternal Son of God. So then they sang these songs, which songs were, of course, blasphemous, denying the deity of Christ. The Arminians make up their own songs, which teach that Christ died for everybody, head for head, and that salvation depends upon man's own free will. And that's not the Christ of Scripture either. That's another Jesus. So Christ too is derided in songs, lied about and slandered. In the history of the New Testament church, one thinks especially of the Puritans, they were mocked in very, by various songs and in plays. 
including Shakespeare's plays. Uh, presumably there were some hypocrites among the Puritans, as there were with every group in Christendom, but generally they're presented as exemplars of the village idiot in play and in song. Well, David was there. They mocked him in their songs. And if you ask, well, who is it who's speaking against and reproaching David? So he becomes their byword and even their song. Well, verse 4 uses the word enemies. They were enemies of David. Well, of course they were enemies. I mean, if they're friends, what would the enemies be like? And verse 12 tells us that these were enemies who sat in the gate. And the gate was the entryway into a, a walled city. So it was the central place of concourse. Let's say a city had four or six gates. So you'd go in and you go out through, through the gate. And then respectable people would sit there. Judges, elders to hear cases, legal cases. Businessmen would meet there to transact their dealings. We have this at the end of the book of, book of Ruth where Boaz goes out to the men at the gate and he marries Ruth. They agree that he is the kinsman redeemer, the closest who approves of this transaction and then he buys the field, gets that. And then of course, there were not only respectable people, so to speak, in high office, who met there, or people with, with money. There were other less respectable people, those who were the spectators at the courts and the business, and presumably they too would have sat down if they were there for any time or if their legs got tired. And then you'd have the odd beggar, because that's a good place to beg. People are coming past. And the odd idler. But you have these who sit in the gate, and they're speaking against David. And at the end of this description of David's enemies, verse 12 mentions the drunkards. Uh, the drunkards, they can't walk in a straight line. They can't control their tongues. They can't think straight. And eventually, if they keep at it, they can't even hold down a job, and they can't provide for their families. The drunkards. So David says... David says the people who sit in the gate, the high ones and possibly the more idle ones, but certainly even to the lower stratification of the drunkards, they're speaking against him, reviling him, treating him as a byword and singing and laughing against him in their ribaldry. When I wept, and chastened my soul with fasting. That was to my reproach. I made sackcloth also my garment, and I became a proverb or byword to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the song of the drunkards. And in terms of someone's being humiliated, it's one thing to be mocked by the high and mighty, the people who are really seem to be great in this world, they don't think much of me. But it's even more galling to be mocked by the base and even those who are drunk at some tavern and vomiting on the floor. If they belittle you, well then apparently you're not up to much. And Job makes a similar point in his lament in Job chapter 30, the passage we read. The previous chapter says that Job was treated with amazing respect. The elders and the dignitaries would doff their cap at him. People would, would zip their mouth when he went by. That's Job. We, Job really is somebody. We have to behave ourselves here. Now, Job says, after God had struck him with this terrible disease, even the youth deride me. And I, I wouldn't have even put their fathers into employment. I wouldn't have given their dads a job. But their children, their children mock me. And then he explains the, 
poverty and even wretchedness of these people. They had to flee from towns and they dwelled in the wilderness and in caves and dug up the roots of all sorts of unpalatable plants to eat. They lived among the bushes and were gathered under the nettles. Verse 8 says, they were children of fools. And it means their parents were fools and they were like their parents, fools themselves who couldn't even understand how the world works. To gather some finances, to build themselves an ordinary home, to order things even according to the light of nature. And now, says Job, these people who are the lowest of the low, this is the argument of the text, now I am their song. These people make songs and laugh at me. Yea, I am their byword. They abhor me. They flee far from me and spare not to spit in my face. Pretty vivid. Our text, therefore, and especially this second point of the sermon, really is very, very vivid. We've seen David's life, which pictures the godliness of Jesus, and we say, well, you know, we're not there. We're not there. We're a long way from such piety. And then when we look at this sort of opposition, and it is powerful, we say, well, I don't get persecuted to that way, to that degree. I do suffer, says the Christian, of various people who slander and mock me, sometimes the most ridiculous slanders you think these people have they any imagination or they, they don't even have to be credible. But anyway. And then you wonder, well, what do we expect of those who abuse us? Well, in the passage, Psalm 69, not many turned around, even when he responded very godly to his abuse. And even when he behaved amazingly well and you say I would have thought some of them at least would have caught themselves on or given up or stopped at least but one can only say with the people who David is speaking about in this psalm that they were particularly hardened they were firmly set on their evil way and nothing he could do would make them make them behave or come round and whether or not they turn, whoever slanders or reproaches us, the Christian isn't to give in, and he is simply to press on like Jesus Christ with his face set like a flint to go up to Jerusalem. That's all you can do. I would have hoped that some of them would have caught themselves on, but it isn't going to happen, and it certainly didn't happen there. You just follow on after the Lord. This brings us to our third and final point. How did David respond to this abuse? He responded righteously, then they responded to his godly behavior and derided him even further and made songs about him. How did he respond this time? He still didn't despair. He still didn't cave in, renouncing God and his truth. It didn't even serve to dampen his zeal, which is what you probably would have expected. So he became less faithful and he didn't lose his temper and he didn't take vengeance on his enemies. The passage doesn't even mention some of the lawful responses that he could have given. He could have engaged in self-examination. He could have said, you know, I have all these people mocking me. You know what? Maybe they have a point. I mean, it's very helpful to consider that. Maybe they do have a point. And then you say you have to work out what's true and what's false. Maybe David did do that, but it's not really not mentioned in this passage. Maybe I have been hypocritical. Maybe I have gone over the top as they're saying. I mean, I'd imagine that David would have thought these things, considered them, but if he did, he didn't put them down in this text. He didn't here in Psalm 69 protest his innocence. 
though he does that elsewhere. And there's a little bit of it when he says in verse 4, they that hate me without a cause are more in the hairs of mine head. He's saying that to God. But maybe he also said that to them, but these people are so twisted, I don't think he'd get anywhere anyway. And here in Psalm 69, we don't even read of his arguing with the ungodly. Now Christ did that. Whenever they derided and mocked him, sometimes he would walk away, but on other occasions, he debated them head on. When they called him Beelzebub, he said, now hold on a minute here. If I'm casting out demons by Beelzebub, by whose power do your sons cast them out? And then if Satan is divided against Satan and Satan is then casting out some of the other demons, how is his kingdom going to stand? You people need to think about the charges you're making against me. They don't even make sense. So he did argue back at times. But that's not mentioned here in Psalm 69. There are other godly responses in which David could have engaged and which scripture speaks of. Reading and meditating upon God's word. Taking comfort from the oracles of Jehovah. He could have even thanked God for being persecuted like the apostles did in Acts chapter 5. Or he could have sung a psalm. You know what I need when these guys are going for me? I need to sing one of my favorite psalms. And that always cheers my spirit. Here at least he's writing a psalm and presumably he sung it too. But the one that's mentioned here is prayer. He prayed. Verses 10 through 11 when I wept, chastened my soul, fasted, wore sackcloth, they reproached me, they made me into a byword, and I was the song of the drunkards. But as for me, verse 13, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord. I'm going to pray. And I am praying right now. And David does this in Psalm 109, the psalm we read earlier. Psalm 109, verse 2. The mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are opened against me. They've spoken against me with a lying tongue. They surround me with words of hatred. They fight against me without a cause. For my love they are become my adversaries. And then he says what he's going to do about it. But I give myself unto prayer. They're going to say whatever they want, but I'm going to pray. Good answer. And this fits with those wise inspired words of James in chapter 5. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any among you afflicted? Number one thing to do, pray. pray. Pour out your heart onto the Lord. And David then in this prayer, first thing he mentions in his argument to God is God's mercy. Talks about God's mercy because mercy is that divine attribute that especially befits and is the divine response onto misery. The misery of God's people calls for the mercy of God, because mercy is that loving kindness of God directed to those who are, and who know themselves to be, wretched. David says, there's a multitude of mercy with God. It's infinite, and it comes to me through the channel of God's covenant, of which covenant David was an Old Testament head and picture of Christ, the covenant of David. <coughs> And this mercy is that which our sympathetic high priest grants to all of his people in their time of need because he is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points tempted like as we are and he was harassed far worse than David. Mercy. And David then turns from God's mercy to the truth of his salvation. A salvation which is only found in Jesus Christ, the suffering king who proceeded from David's own loins. David understood that. Acts 2 verse 30. David knew the Savior was going to come as a lineal descendant of his own. 
Verse 4, they hate me without a cause. John 15. Verse 9, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. John chapter 2. Also verse 9, the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. Quoted of Christ in Romans 15. The spirit in David was writing about David's own greater son. The truth of thy salvation, that's what I'm appealing to. Faithfulness in the Savior who delivers us. And when this salvation is said to be true, it's faithful and sure that this salvation means that my sins are forgiven. I'm going to be vindicated by God, and so I don't need to protest till the cows come home. He will take care of my name. And he's going to preserve me and glorify me. So David didn't, didn't cave in. And he mentions, too, an acceptable time. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in an acceptable time. An acceptable time either in David's making the prayer or an acceptable time with regard to God's answering the prayer. And finally, therefore, the application to us is that in our afflictions, and abuse and mockery, which are nowhere near as bad as that of David and Jesus Christ, our text is saying, though without denying any of the other biblical exhortations and directives, that the number one thing is to pray about it. Is any afflicted? Let him pray. Am I afflicted? Prayer. And in my prayer, number two, I'm to appeal to the multitude of God's mercy, because he's rich in mercy, for that great love wherewith he loved us. Ephesians 2 verse 4. And I appeal to the truth of God's salvation, that I'm chosen in Jesus before the foundation of the world, that the blood of the Lamb of God was shed for my sins, and his Spirit is working in me, and he's going to glorify me. I pray in the light of that and bringing that to God in prayer and God uses that truth that I bring to him to comfort me and strengthening myself in that truth my faith is quickened and he answers my prayer that's what David found and number three I pray in the consciousness of an acceptable time I know now that the acceptable time for prayer is whenever you don't say, well, I don't know, now's not a good time to pray for God. Amen. No, the acceptable time for offering prayer is all times. But the acceptable time for the answer of prayer is whatever's acceptable to God, whenever he wills. And then as we pray and are unburdened, God teaches us to wait for the acceptable time that, that, that pleases him. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that thou would guide our minds and hearts as we look at thy servant David in this psalm, so that the power of the scripture and by the Holy Spirit may mold us so that we do not <coughs> cave in or fold, but that we persevere and we learn to look up to thy Son, Jesus Christ, our faithful Savior. For we offer our prayers with gratitude in his name. Amen. Let's now sing that part of Psalm 69, verses 7 through 13. 7 through 13 of the 69th Psalm. For I have borne reproach for thee, my face is hid with shame, to reverence strange, to wonder sons and alien
now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.